architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening yet once again to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker to advance the frontier of architectural thinking. But also, if the truth be told, a lot of these conversations are me trying to interrogate, have fun, hang out with my friends, new friends, friend, people I'm trying to make friends with with the idea of sharing ideas and cultivating relationships. That's certainly what's going on today as I speak to Franz Ziegler, architect and urban planner who lives for the most in Rotterdam, uh, but also in Maastricht, both in Holland. And as you will see from the conversation, Franz and I go back a very long time. You will hear our history and you will hear the story of Holland, India, and global architecture. Here we go. I hope you enjoy it. And as we say here in the United States, happy Thanksgiving. So Franz, so you have been practicing in Holland for how long now? I have been in practice for almost 30 years now. My own practice since 18 years. 2002 I started. 2002 you started and now one of the problems with Holland is that every street corner has an architect and an urban designer yes you know what what is the story with you guys in Holland you know what's going on how come you have so many excellent architects I don't tell me tell me the truth what's the real reason how this happens just to nuance it, uh, Italy has more architects than Netherlands, but you know that Dutch are tradespeople. You know, we've been selling stuff all around the world for centuries, yeah. and we're just really great in selling our architecture. So you have the impression that we have so many good architects, but they're just good tradesmen. Good salesmen. Salesmen, yes, that's it. <laughs> And very good in media, very good in media. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised you haven't had more Dutch architects in your show. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But uh, proportionately speaking, I probably have had quite a few. So, uh, but I'm just thinking about salesmen. And so that's one of the reasons that perhaps you like going to India, because that's also a country of salesmen, no? <laughs> Excellent question. Of course, I knew I, the question was going to come. Why did I go to India? But for me, it was absolutely not something about trying to get into the market there or trying to do some architecture there. It was purely uh, interest in the country and I had some intuition that I was going to meet some good people there just an intuition you were walking down the street and you had this intuition there must be something that drew you seriously knew very very little about india i have to tell you that um, my father is an urbanist planner as well and uh, traveled around the world as an as a consultant uh, working for a big uh, consultancy com company in uh, in the netherlands and uh, since 70s, uh, he's gone around the world, but he hadn't been to India. So that was one of the choices that I made. I have to go somewhere where he, he, he didn't go. You know, I was in, um, in Egypt as a, as a child. Uh, that was uh, 78, 79. Uh, I was yeah. 10, 11 years old. And I think uh, that made a really lasting impression uh, on my, on my yeah, young years. And um, uh, it really drew me into a sort of traveling uh, uh, spirit. So this is one of the great advantages you guys have in Holland. I like the English and the French is that uh, you had a colonial empire uh, 
and I remember, of course, Rem also started in Indonesia somewhere, didn't he? He's, he was uh, born in Indonesia. Yes. Yes. And uh, that that uh, perspective, you know, I think uh, does something. It lodges something in your brain, and then you just can't. Uh, uh, you have to find out what it is. Maybe that's why, because I mean, this is what I remember about you is uh, 1990. That's right. Context and Modernity Conference at TU Delft. <laughs> and Franz Ziegler and uh, Marcel Musch were the co-organizers. And I was a young graduate student at Cornell. And, uh, and, 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 and I uh, went to that conference. And that's when I met you. That's right. And I think it was, what, uh, one year later, I was in Ahmedabad. Uh, and I was trying to finish my PhD there and teaching at SEPT at the Center for Environmental Planning and Technology. And there you were. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's also coincidental. And what were you doing in India then? Well, in that conference we were talking about, uh, Context and Modernity, that was set up by a large, a very enthusiastic student group, a lot of my friends. We got together, uh, there was originally an idea by Alexander Tsonis, one of our professors, and he um, basically asked if we would like to uh, organize a conference on critical regionalism. And he had proposed quite a few a number of, uh, of guests to come to this uh, seminar. And uh, one of them was uh, B.V. Doshi, Bal Krishna okay. Doshi. So uh, it so happened that we started talking during the conference and um, yeah, I was really drawn to his uh, perspectives and uh, it, it all seemed very attractive to, uh, to start a conversation, which led to an, um, an exchange. And uh, two years later, myself went for the first exchange between Delft and University of Delft and uh, Sept Amdabad. And uh, that's how we met for the second time, which was so <laughs> coincidental. <laughs> Those are such good times. Those are such good times. Uh, and why did you learn about architecture from India? Oh, I learned so many things. Um, where to start? I've, I've, I was studying in, in Delft in a, in a great place, but it was quite a huge university. Um, a lot, lot of different uh, researchers, uh, a lot of directions. Um, and we were, we were trying to find a course. Uh, it was an ex interesting time because uh, Delft was very um, informed by uh, the Team 10 group. That is, uh, Herzberger uh -huh. van Eyck <clears throat> had dominated the school for many years. Um, but Rem Koolhaas was just entering actually uh, quite some years, but uh, it really um, became a sort of uh, polemic uh, at the time in which different um, discussions and courses uh, happened. And then um, when I went to India, um, I, um, I came to a, a great school, but it was very small and it seemed to be a very strong uh, community of teachers who were having their own debate but it was much closer together and the community was very small. And um, I think uh, of the team 10 ideas and the discussions that came out of that, uh, I got a much deeper uh, sense in India. And I, I realized that many of the, uh, those ideas and those discussions um, also uh, came from India. So you're saying India is the manifestation of the ideals of team 10. Well, you know that Herzberger and Van Eyck and uh, the whole uh, structuralist group from Netherlands, they were uh, oriented towards uh, Africa and they had a lot of stories. That's an amazing line of argument. I had never thought about that. I mean, it's true that they were oriented to that. They had all those stories and, 
And the idea of a habitat, which has this high degree of urban, spatial, cultural complexity, as different from the sort of clear patterns and ideals of modernism, would must have been a significant reference point for that sort of structuralist viewpoint, no? Absolutely, absolutely. I think the whole um, architectural idiom also suits and in a much um, more natural way in, 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 in India. Because I remember, I mean, I remember, you know, somehow I ended up teaching that studio that you were doing, although we were basically peers, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember it was the thesis studio and I was co-teaching with Chaya. Yes. And you were in that studio and, you know, we were talking about this and we we're talking about that and we we're trying to, and I was trying to bring in the latest deconstruction and sort of uh, all these kind of ideas into that studio. And I was trying to sell this complex thinking and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was so sure, and, and there was this space in the old city. We were looking at the structure of the old city, its morphology and so on. And uh, and there was this space in the between, and, and we came to you, and and you had done nothing. And <laughs> and I remember very distinctly, and you were talking about this space and this street, and how it creates this uh, this uh, you know residual space over here, and how this angle moves around, and this that da 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 da. da. And so then I remember asking you, so why didn't you do anything? He said, you said. I don't need to do anything. It's perfect already. <laughs> yes, this is this is a fantastic uh, memory, Vikram. Because and it was a very important project for me, doing nothing, but <laughs> analyzing the situation and really seriously looking at the spaces and uh, understanding it. Yeah, it was it was strange because I'd done all these projects in Delft, and this is exactly what I mean: is that. Um, it was an analytical project for me. I, I happened to land up in the conservative group, like conserving. <laughs> and um, it seemed great fun to me, you know, like uh, not doing something new, but conserving, restoring, uh, looking at the spaces and presenting a, a piece of city which had organically grew as a design, you know, selling yeah. it. <laughs> 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 There's the salesman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. That was a mind-blowing event. I just couldn't believe it because I was so sure that this cool Dutch architect is going to make a gem of a modernist, uh, je ne sais quoi, you know, with like this and this and this and this and this. And he said, no, no need to do anything. It's perfect. I was just listening to the interview you did with uh, Neil Kanchaya. Yeah? Uh -huh. And it was uh, as if, you know, uh, 25 years just flew by and the discussions kept going on. It was a, it, it was a great interview and he still has this spirit of uh, cooperative design. You know, it's not like something uh, one student does, but uh, they're passing it on. And this was the, uh, this was a very consequent way of teaching. I think he's still doing the, doing it. I mean, it's very nostalgic, particularly nowadays when I, you know, I ran studio this morning on Zoom. Mm. And the contrast between what it is to run a studio on Zoom and what we were doing there in Sept in the early 90s, you know, small school, intense, everything on paper, studios were full, people would sleep under their desks. <laughs> Uh, you know, crits would go on for hours and hours, and then we would sit under the trees and drink chai and talk about this and that. And there was KK, and there was Shumitra, and then there was Nisha, and then there was Anambat, and then there was <laughs> Chaya and Varki. It was now looking back and Bobby Desai in between, and it was quite quite a different architectural ethos, wasn't it? Yes and no. I mean, as you're talking, I'm remembering it. Maybe I, I turned conservative, but <laughs> I still uh, cherish 
doing hand drawings and having those discussions. And um, I like to think that many things have changed and you can emphasize that, but I can, I, I, I like continuity and uh, so many things um, seem to regain value. Like I just got a new iPad where you can actually draw on the screen one of yeah. your what yeah. one of the, your your techniques that you have done so beautifully earlier on drawing yeah. on the screen. And I still have resistance to it because I like to you know draw on a piece of paper and feel the the fabric of a paper and and make a photograph and you know it still has uh, this magic of handmade stuff. It's mm. still there and it still works. Yeah. And you and Fritz Pambum, whom I also interviewed uh, in this podcast earlier, are the are the kings of the line drawing, man. You guys make such amazing line drawings. I am so in awe of your ability to, to make that drawing and, and say so much with so little marketing. Now I know it's all marketing. Uh. <laughs> I will admit that, Vikram. I will admit it because I, while thinking about what we would talk about in this interview, I was thinking um, you're interviewing me, but I'm much more comfortable interviewing you. One of the mm -hmm. techniques that we use when we have a new client, you know, we don't okay. try to impress them with, uh, you know, beautiful renderings, uh, you know, images of what they could be building. Uh -huh. but. Basically, um, I like to interview and see what they have to say. And of course, many architects do this, but I mean, you can take this a little bit further by not only recording what they are answering, but drawing it out. Yeah. So analyzing uh, what is being said in combination with the location, the site, the, the, the place and what feelings they have and even bring out historical photographs and starting to trace the history and telling them, okay, I can see this. Do you see this also? And actually drawing them into um, a situation in which they feel they're designing. Yeah. And they're you're talking about drawing live while you're running. Your and drawing, yeah. drawing live or, or, or bringing drawings, yeah. uh, which are basically traces. Yeah and reductions of um, stuff that they have brought in. Mm. So it's like an, a, 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 an intense dialogue in that way, yeah. in which not it, for them, and maybe, of course, the skill is with me or with us when we draw, but it's uh, the feeling that you're designing together. We don't need an Apple iPad for that. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. So what is it about the pen on paper? What is it? What, what, why? What does that do? Describe the emotion to me when you're doing that. What do you feel? Does your heartbeat go up? Does your hand tremble? To make a drawing still, I have a resistance or I have a little doubt, but when we, when I um, put the, pen on the paper, uh, you can actually get into a flow. The flow, which we use so often now, you know, this exciting mm -hmm. moment when things start to go and uh, you get inspired or whatever. But yeah. the flow is, is quite literal that you uh, trace and uh, um, things happen by itself. And um, as Fritz Palmbaum has already probably remarked to you, it's uh, a skill which is at some point inherent where you don't uh, think, but it, it happens. Huh? Richard Sennett talks about it in his Craftsman, mm -hmm. is that if you draw a lot, uh, there are things that happen automatically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The drawing draws itself. So many times I hear this. Drawing draws itself, the music writes itself. The sentence composes itself. And that's that's a happy moment when you see that happen. Yeah. Things just happen. <laughs> not, not just. It's, it's practice. It, uh, 
over and over. Riyaz, and, it's Riyaz. It's the job of doing it again and again every day. That's you remember what Riyaz that Riyaz that Riyaz means practice. Okay. Everyday musicians, classical musicians in India do Riyaz. Uh, so that's what it is. It's so beautiful where Richard Sennett describes that, you know, a skill at an average needs 10,000 hours to learn. Yeah? And for some people that takes 10 years or some people can, you know, if they work hard in three years, but it is uh, so many hours of work to gain into a skill. Perspiration and inspiration, 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. <laughs> There's a sort of an idea of Protestant work ethic in that too. Uh, so do you have uh, favorite pens or do you, does it have to be a particular type of pen and a particular type of paper or will anything do? I, I'm a bit stuck to the simple pilot fine liner, but I love to experiment with other pens as well and see what comes out. I would like to go back to charcoal and so, so on, like uh, mm. messy charcoal. stuff. Messy, messy stuff, but you don't do messy, Franz. I, I know you. You don't do messy. You do the precise line. Uh, it, it used to be a line which is sharp and, and graphic. But now I'm going back to pencil in combination with a fine line to bring a little bit of softness and, you know, more of the hand in the drawing. I, I noticed that, you know, that, that it convinces better. Yeah. Marketing. Constantly, constantly, <laughs> constantly. Now I remember your sort of breakthrough project. You know, you did that theater uh, in Utrecht. No, where was it? Uh, Rotterdam. 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 In Rotterdam itself, where you had this sort of shed inside inside a glass box. It was a stage in this inside a inside a stage. You know, it was sort of played with this whole idea of theater. But uh, but really, you're basically now an urban designer, an urban planner, urban designer, urban facilitator, right? Is this fair? Yes. I do a project, an architectural project a year. One project a year, but basically, yeah. Basically, 70% is urban planning, urban design. Why? Why do you prefer urban design, urban planning? I think uh, my personality and my way of working uh, suits very well uh, complex problems with many stakeholders and resulting in adapting um, urban situations where there are more stakeholders, more uh, users, more people involved. And um, as I gained experience, um, I uh, like to think about how cities work in general, but how uh, you can... Um... Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's like you are into this whole idea. It feels like urban design with so many stakeholders and so many variables. It's like a clockwork many different interconnected moving parts. Yes. Like, like a complex Swiss watch. Is that what it is? Or is it the human relationships and the conversation and just the hanging out with people that you like? No, seriously, that's, that's really both. But, you know, you're working on a city which is preferably organically grown it has a history it has uh, a landscape underneath it's become an urban landscape it's a special composition which you're going to change which has to adapt which is is even if you don't do anything it's going to change anyway so to have a role in this to give it a push um, and to to think of projects as processes which have phases and to 
put your mind to design the phases. So basically you're designing something dynamic in opposition to architecture, which is just the finishing an object, taking a photograph and uh, it has a beginning and an end. In mm -hmm. design, it's so fascinating that you're jumping on a train and at some point you jump off again, it goes on. So then let's talk about the opposite then. Because you and I have spent a lot of time in the modernist city, Chandigarh. Right. right. And that was designed by old man Cabuzier on, well, it wasn't tabula rasa, but he made it into tabula rasa. Mm -hmm. And he made a perfect, you know, fully planned city. So that's the opposite of the city you are describing, but we have spent a lot of great time in Chandigarh and you love going to Chandigarh. Explain that then. How does that add up? Yeah, we can go on for hours now, of course. This yeah, is, yeah. Uh, we are going to go on for hours. The great, the great thing about Chandigarh is that it has been planned and perfectly designed you know, as a blueprint city and I am very sure, and you also, I think, that Corbusier knew how it would change. Yeah. So that the starting point had to be clear narrative, a clear, a clear situation, uh, something that is finished. And yet we know that, especially later in his career, he was very aware of um, uh, that things will move on after that. Um, I recently saw a drawing he made of Venice, you know, I think when he was doing the hospital in Venice, he was very aware that things will will start changing. So um, one of the things we see is how the landscape, the, the, the trees, the, 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 the greenery of Chandigarh has completely changed the city, has overtaken the city um, in, in a big way. Uh, so the so the grid is a completely different grid than it was in in 1960. It's much more beautiful, you have to say. We do. And uh, the market centers, you know, which used to be um, designed as completely independent community centers, uh, they've specialized. Uh, that's another thing that I've I found fascinating in in, in Chandigarh. Every market has become different, has different uh, stuff to sell. Uh, uh, certain markets are great hangout places, otherwise you are other ones you never go to. Yeah. So even in this um, planned city, the change and the process it has gone through is one of the things that I like about it. So what are your views on preservation then, on preservation of Chandigarh? You think it should not be preserved? No, I, th I think certainly there are some uh, aspects to uh, preserve. I'm working in a couple of neighborhoods in Maastricht, city of Maastricht, who has quite interesting um, compositions from the 50s community, basically set up in a similar way as the sectors in Chandigarh. And uh, a couple of these centers are going to be refurbished, remodeled, and I'm guiding the um, process in which the new center um, answers to the questions that are set out now, um, and, but are inspired and are uh, uh, evolved from the original uh, design. So uh, this is maybe not pure conservation, but it is uh, informing the new design with what, what has been there. And in some cases, we actually um, renovate the 50s buildings as well. So it's the newest answer, but we have to get out of uh, this polemic idea. It's either new or old, you know, the, mm. the, the in between is so interesting. Yeah. Always changing, always changing. In architecture, the similar 
a, a situation is happening in which we see now um, architects and rest, restoration, conserv conservation architects working much more close together, uh, where the buildings um, are reused and added on to in a way in which you can hardly see what is old and new. There's a very, very um, soft um, transition that is designed, mm. much more subtle than um, we used to do old and new as two entities. So you are very much about the sort of uh, contextualist argument, then, you know, the sort of idea of sympathetic contextual insertions into the city. You're not about wiping things clean and or making completely different objects. Certainly. That's the main mainstream now. What do you mean? I think uh, uh, context, physical or organizational, managerial, everything in Europe is very much about continuity and about mm -hmm. evolving the context in a very gradual um, way in which very precisely is defined what's important, what's historically important. And uh, these are the foundations of projects. I see very little um, uh, projects which um, can afford to do a clean sheet uh, situation. But have you been back to India recently, haven't you? Yes, I was there just before the lockdown in February. And what do you think about uh, growth and development in India nowadays? No, I, when I go to India, I still try very hard to see India in 1992, because that's what I <laughs> long for. <laughs> I still see it. You still see it? I still see it. Or we, or, or we create it. You know, we sit with Riyals and friends and recreate 1992. Yeah, I don't know. It's increasingly tough for me, man. When I go back to India, I just like feel like, where am I? Why am I here? You know, it, I, it just feels like, uh, in some ways, I'm glad. I mean, the place has moved on. You know, I feel released from India now. You know, next time I go to India, I'm going to go look at the old temples, like not even go to, you know, the old 90s. I, I'm going to go to the 1000 AD. You know, before this interview, I was thinking I will not get myself to speak in broad terms about India. Because one of the things that I learned from my travels in India that there are no generalizations about India. And I think when I read the newspapers about India, if I read respected journalists about India, I'm always critical because I always feel that there's too much of generalization, too much uh, big trends. And there is a lot of things written about India, which you don't experience when you're there and you feel that it's written um, to please the Western reader. Um, so when I go to India, I, I, and, I, and there is always this big questions, is it like this or is it like this? Is what I'm seeing um, uh, a general um, situation? I always find immediately the opposite very, very soon. So yeah. all, the, okay. all the aspects of liberalization and, and materialism, and it's all there. And yet turn the corner and you see the opposite. How did the SEPT campus feel now that it has been significantly transformed? Well, we had an exhibition uh, there. So yeah, congratulations. It was uh, a, a great opportunity to re-interact with, with SEPT and um, um, show eight projects quite elaborately. We got two huge models made 
in Amdabad. So we did some work in Amdabad to get the models on the exhibition. Uh, they were accepted in the new library of SEPT. Yep. Which is, um, yeah, a very um, international style, but beautiful building by Rohu Matra, mm -hmm. uh, with some beautiful spaces where well, our exhibition sat quite quite beautifully. So uh, I had a I had some good conversations with young students, teachers um, about my work, and yeah, it, again, it felt a bit coming home <laughs> to a place I know very well. Of course, it's changed a lot. It's become very professional, very uh, clean, mm -hmm. uh, much uh, more structured. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good atmosphere. It's a good atmosphere. So let's try generalizations about Holland then. How, well, how do you think about you know, where your work is going and what is this sort of emerging urban planning and urban design world in Holland, you know, into the 21st century, you know. Do you think that the Holland architectural milieu is uh, uh, doing exciting work like it used to in the 90s? In the 90s, there was... Uh, kind of clear uh, direction, I think, this were the years and when Rem Kohlhaas really had a great impact mm -hmm. and started a school of architects, which you are referring to, who were fantastic in marketing and doing conceptual work, which went around the world, the super Dutch. I would say um, around 2005, 2008, uh, maybe around the economic crisis, uh, there was a kind of backlash in the sense that there's a new generation which is much more about smaller, uh, more detailed uh, work that is crafted. Uh, uh, Peter Zumtor was very important, had a big impact in the architectural um, world. I think this is what I was just talking about, where architects started to look for the, the more maker's perspective, mm -hmm. um, working a lot together with uh, restoration, with heritage, these fields. So what is the project you are working on? What is the sort of project you're excited on nowadays that you are working on? In the last year, we have been working on a station complex in the city of Nijmegen. It's also a building which has a long history. It was built in 1892, then bombed in the Second World, then rebuilt by a post-war architect. Um, and after that, there have been many changes, and especially the whole urban siting was uh, very, very complex with um, different modalities of, uh, of traffic and uh, so we're we're restructuring this, and it's exciting because it's uh, both a great urban challenge with routing and with um, immense numbers of cycles to park, and you know it's it's the it's it has a lot of uh, sustainability aspects to it because people take trains nowadays and go on their bikes to the train station, which creates exciting but new complex uh, composition and at the same time it is a architectural challenge because it involves heritage buildings and yet it has to really transform to a new type of uh, building so very much the ziegler project ethos yes i like it a lot it's uh, it's 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 a large uh, uh, complex it's very uh, complex matter and a lot of clients. I've got five clients. <laughs> five clients. Sounds like a nightmare to me, but you love it. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. I realize that that's, uh, that's what I'm good at. The more clients, the better. <laughs> Why do you like that? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, 
you know, Chandigarh had Le Corbusier as a designer and Nehru as a client. Mm -hmm. And all the other clients under Nehru uh, were not very favorable for Le Corbusier. He hated them. But he had yeah. Nehru as his, you know, ultimate client. Yeah. Um, I seem to uh, have found ways and strategies um, to use the diversity of the different clients, you know, to, in, to be an inspiration to the project. That is, if I don't agree with one client, then I can always use the opinions of the other clients, you know, to find uh, a way out. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, use the diversity and the conflict to your advantage. Absolutely. I like to think that. But you never get caught in the crossfire? Uh, yeah, but uh, then you just have to wait eh? and let the crossfire go. <laughs> let them <laughs> fight together. <laughs> That there are there are ways in which you can underline certain and draw certain interests which you think need support, you know, the softer uh, kind of interest and the harder commercial necessities. They have to be taken serious and they have to pay for the project, but you can't draw it, you know, you can draw the the, the special and the tectonic and the material side of the project. And finally, if the project like the station has a strong identity, you know, it's not a station anywhere, but it's the station of Nijmegen. It finally has a commercial value as well. When there are difficult conflicts and it seems that the commercial aspect is overruling other aspects, which I find important, it's kind of the job or the skill to turn this around and to discuss more the architectural uh, qualities and finally prove that the identity that the whole project gets also improves the commercial value. Nowadays, most people will justify their projects through some kind of sustainability and ecological argument. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard you use those words at all. <laughs> yeah, too much heritage and <laughs> but sustainability is absolutely we discuss sustainability a lot and uh, you can frame heritage even as sustainability but I think uh, biodiversity and green green in the city, urban green um, can add so much value and we use that a lot to make less in stone, pave less mm -hmm and uh, bring in robust green structure right into the heart of the city. One of the other major topics nowadays, of course, is immigration. And I know this whole question of immigration into Europe, particularly into Northern Europe, is a controversial project, controversial topic. Uh, is immigration new migrants uh, are you working with the, any such things when you design these big urban centers? You know, how do you sort of, is that a topic? How to, is, are they one of your clients ever? Yeah, this gets framed into the term inclusive city. Mm -hmm. Yes, city, mm -hmm. which I have read a lot about. It's, it's very interesting, but it has very, very, indirect relation to design of these uh, centers. Of course, diverse program, mixed program, no fun monofunctional programming is very important. Yeah. I'm working with a very interesting um, philanthropic client who is building a school in Rotterdam South. And uh, we are doing the urban setting for this uh, school. They're actually yeah. fragmenting the school into like six smaller satellites into the neighborhood and uh, inviting other functions into the school and mixed use or double use of the school in the, uh, in the neighborhood. 
Um, this is the closest that I can get into that. You know that they are testing certain things and in their approach, monitoring their input is, uh, is very much part of the, the whole program. So the school is uh, testing certain new strategies in teaching and education and mm -hmm. they're monitoring it and bringing it back to the government. I mean, I guess the question that I'm getting to is uh, in the end with all these clients and all this sort of engaged participatory design and all the sort of uh, conflict management, does the architecture basically look like an updated version of Team 10 modernism? Or does it start to look very different? I mean, does it look uh, uh, Indian in some ways or, 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 or Indonesian or, you know, or Algerian? Uh, or does Holland still look very Holland? This is a little bit beside my work, but I can refer to a, the architecture of a very good friend of mine. He's pure Dutch, but he has a Suriname wife. And he's done a project which is uh, informed by Moroccan architecture, Le Midi, and uh, a project informed by Suriname uh, architecture, which he knows uh, very well. And he's made this amazing mix of very Dutch architecture and these new cultures uh, in, in, inside. Um, the Suriname project is very much um, inhabited by uh, immigrant Suriname people. Uh, the Moroccan one was so successful that uh, it was gentrified, you know? So it was uh, basically middle-class Dutch people who loved to live in uh, such a, uh, a project. So uh, I don't think that architecture in a way, uh, can really sustain inclusive society. Cannot? In some cases it can, but in that case, you know, it was built to reflect the Moroccan people from, or from origin Moroccan people in Netherlands. Um, but the image was kind of bought into by middle-class Dutch. Mm -hmm. Which is fine. I mean, I have no problem with that. I mean, uh... You know, middle class Dutch people do yoga. That's okay. It's uh, but but it, but it's good to have yoga. No, I mean it's good to have sort of Suriname's uh, architecture, and uh, I mean I guess the way I'm taking this, you know, the next question is, you know, are you designing? Are you bringing your Indian? Are you bringing the old city of Ahmedabad into your designs or not? <laughs> Well, I still sometimes analyze the location and then decide to do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> Prove that there is no problem. <laughs> and this is sustainable, Vikram. You know, so often we think that things have to change and then we have to really look at, at the situation. Mm we might come to a solution which is very close to what's there. Not very sexy, not for the magazines, but it's very sustainable. A lot of consumerism in architecture. Yeah, yeah. Architecture is very much about consumerism. So you are the anti-consumerist architect. I'm, I'm not going to make a broad statement like that, but consumerism is one of the things that we really have to deal with. I was just reading an article that Overpopulation in the world is seen as the yeah, biggest threat, but it's not overpopulation itself. It's the addition of all the consumerists. The, con con the consuming population is the problem. It is the problem. The Industrial civilization is a problem. I mean, this whole business of overproducing goods is the problem. The article was framing that, you know, we are now looking at Africa because there the biggest population growth is there, but it's basically a way of, you know, uh, looking away and stating that the problem is in Africa and whereas we are the problem. Our consumer 
our, our consumerism is the, the first problem. You mean here we in the West consume too much, is what you're saying? Yes. We need to consume less. Yes. Yes. Downsizing our, downsizing our homes, uh, making do with a lot less, reusing everything. Yeah, but that sounds very dull. But uh, going back to '92, one of the yeah. things that I really loved about going to India the first time was uh, to see uh, how people could do with much less and be happy. And I was very happy with much less. I uh, left all my stuff as a weight in Netherlands, and I was very light-footed traveling around and basically needing very little. Yes, and spending very little <laughs> and uh, <laughs> having a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. It's like the tiny house movement. You know, people love to, you know, go into extremely small uh, houses and only own 100 objects and uh, being extremely happy with that. Mm. Less is more. <laughs> Uh, all that is true and in the end old man Corb also retired to his cabin in south of France it's like nothing it's like a um, minimalist uh, very small place it's so amazing there's so many views on that man which <laughs> uh, can be very prophetic you know ahead, ahead of time it, so you can read so many things there living in a tiny house but we had good times in Ahmedabad, right? I mean, you remember Akasha apartments and we would, we would sit there. I had a nice plush place with lots of uh, <laughs> flowing contraband alcohol. And <laughs> Your house was the center of our community, absolutely. <laughs> Those were amazing, amazing times. So, as we come towards the end over here, what are you looking forward to? You know, what's what is your heart's desire over the next decade, or five years, or two years? Besides <laughs> getting married, I know you're getting married, so that's good. I'm happy not to have any perspective and get, have a big surprise. You know. Okay, I like that. <laughs> you don't make up it. <laughs> yeah, you're you're a Buddhist man. You're an enlightened soul. You're saying my big plan is not to have a plan. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Live in the present. Be in the moment. Eat less. Consume less. Be here now. Yes. Agreed, 100%. Well, well, well. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you, Franz. It's so exciting. Thank you for doing this with me. It was great to talk to you, Vikram. Really good. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thanks again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.